George's public personality has made his group, Culture Club, one of England's most famous exports since the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Last year, they won a Grammy as Best New Artist, and for the ever-colorful, ever-controversial George, a simple thank you wouldn't do. Culture Club. Thank you, America. You've got, you've got taste, style, and you know a good drag queen when you see one. Born George O'Dowd in a middle-class neighborhood outside London, he is one of six children, the son of a construction worker. At school, George didn't do his homework and was placed in a program for problem children. He was eventually expelled at the age of 15. And for the next five years, George joined London street culture, going to clubs and dressing outrageously. When we went to London to visit George, he took us to his old haunts along King's Road. Barbara just bought herself some nice clothes. Yes, I did. <laughs> it was the old haunts with the new George. Short hair, no makeup. He brought along his friends, Philip and Paul. Paul is the one who looks like Paula. I don't, do that. I don't go to Bloomingdale's in New York like this, believe me. No. Imagine what happened. These jackets are great, but um, the shoulders are cut really funny, so like, when you can't pad them, because I only buy things I can pad. Ah, no, these I, like I like big shoulders, you know. It's nice to have something named after. And this pub here used to be like a really big punk pub. It's where they used to have all the bands playing. It used to be, I mean, it's much classier than it was. But is punk out. still a big thing here? It's sort of past, it's hasn't gone. it? No, it's, it's still gone. a big thing. It is in suburbia. You know, it's like, punk is like normal now. Like, yeah, you so, know what I mean? So if punk is normal, what's new? No, but they're not aggressive People anymore. like Philip, sort of freaks, like you know. <laughs> This is an English policeman. Hello. Can I have a picture? What are you filming for? Do you know who he is? No, I don't. You don't? <laughs> Margaret Thatcher, you yeah. know. You don't think I'm going to find Margaret Thatcher? Do you have any idea? Yes, I have, actually. Yeah. <laughs> now that you're looking at it. What do you think it is? Oh, uh, boy, George. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> George took us to his favorite club, the Mud Club, on Charing Cross Road. Your new hairstyle. Thanks, butch, isn't it? Very nice. You're coming more like a man now. Sure. <laughs> it's a private club for the uniquely dressed, and George introduced us to some of his friends. Debbie. Barbara Walton. Hi, Barbara. Someone told me Prince Charles or something. Is that the last? Yeah, you have, haven't you? Yeah. New one now. I think you'll get better rating. Don't you? George has two houses in London. A small one, which is filled with his collection of boy George dolls, crucifixes, and Oriental masks. His bedroom, which is filled with stuffed animals and pillows, looks like a teenage girl's room. Okay, Barbara, I'll take you past my many claims to fame. Not bad, all this platinum. And this room is my clothes pit, which is uh, huh. basically where I keep everything. Where are the wigs? Uh huh, in the bag. Ah. <laughs> this is actually a conventional rubbish bag. You only have every color you want. Let's try. Oh, me? Yeah, come on. Oh, no, no. And the and the black like and the this black hat, yeah, and my plaid. Let's see, uh, cause that was the, that was the look that we first saw. That's where that hat. Yeah, I remember that. Success is more apparent in his other house. It is a large Victorian, once owned by comedian Marty Feldman, which boy George is renovating. The house and its owner have changing faces. He is 23 years old, and he prefers to be called just plain George. George, it's a new look. The short hair, mm -hmm. your hair. I mean, when we went around town, you didn't even have it sprayed the way you do today. Why? Why change the whole image now? Um, the thing is, I don't think of it as an image. It's impossible to explain to people, but what happened to me two years ago is I became Boy George. I mean, I've always been George. I've always been outrageous, you know, for want of a better word. Yeah. And I suddenly became Boy George. I got up in the morning, I put on my hat. I became what people wanted to see. And it was very depressing for me because I am actually an extrovert person. And years before that, I'd gone around dressing up. And suddenly I was doing it for other people. And so now I'm back to myself again. You know, when I want to cut my hair, I cut my hair. When I want to wear a wig, I wear a wig. And I think that if you are pleasing yourself, it does look better. You know, I did get very sort of depressed with that look. And I, I, I felt like, I almost felt like a doll. 
But are you comfortable enough now with you so that you wouldn't have to wear the makeup at all? Um, I wear it because I want to. Yeah. You know, so many people say to me, oh, your gimmick. I haven't got a gimmick. My gimmick is my personality, you know. Why did you start in the first place? Because you did it, as you said, long before it was yeah. fashionable, long before you ever thought that you were going to sing or be mm. a star. Why? Tell me about that little kid who said one day... It was what? basically, I think, um, when I was at school, I found the whole environment that I was in very boring. And I realized that there wasn't really any way that you could say to people, look at me. You know, there was no way of, unless you sort of like were violent or aggressive, there was no way of being heard. And it was my way, I suppose, of, of getting attention in the beginning. But um, eventually it became something that I really enjoyed. And it is no longer something I do for attention. How old were you? At 13. <laughs> I heard your mother used to take you to church and you wore the big platform shoes yeah. and the floppy hats. Yeah. Good heavens, what do the priests think? Um, I think they were grateful people came, because in those days, it started to really deteriorate, you know. I mean, as a kid, I went to Sunday school, like a religious school, every Sunday, for years. So the priest was grateful to have me there. <laughs> it's like, we can forget his shoes. <laughs> what kind of a kid were you? Oh, when I was a, very young, I w it was a case of little boys should be seen and not heard. Yeah. I mean, my father was very strict in the sense that, you know, when he came home from work, he wanted silence. He didn't want, you know, he had six kids who made a lot of noise, and he would always say to us, you know, this is my time, I've worked hard, be quiet. So for, for a long time as a kid, I never really sort of, I used to stay out of the house a lot, you know, and I was very quiet as a kid, you know, very quiet. I had heard that when you were a little kid, you said, all I wanted to do was have my father love me. What I meant by that was that I wanted my father to stop trying to be a macho man. My father's a very, very intelligent guy, and what he used to do was like cover that up with aggression. So he would rant and he would shout and he would smash things. And what was a very intelligent guy appeared to be a very sort of dumb guy. And what about you and your mother? My mother, it's funny because my mother was brought up to believe that women were second-rate citizens. That they didn't have any right to an opinion and that they sort of obeyed the opposite sex without any question. How did you think it should be? I, sh I thought it should be equal, you know. I mean, my mother worked as hard as my father. She might not have been laying bricks and, and mortar, but she was working as hard. And it, I, I hated the, the attitude. You know, it just annoyed me so much. And what were you? Were you a sensitive little kid? Were you an outcast kind of in your own Not head? really. I mean, when you have, like, six kids, obviously yeah. nobody's going to get any more attention. So, you know, like, you learn very quickly as a child that, you know, if you want attention, you have to find it outside. Did you know when you were... 11, 12, 13, on the brink of adolescence, that you were different, that you weren't like the other kids? I knew that I didn't want to be like other people. You wanted to be special? What I'm saying is that I realized that I just didn't want to do what they wanted me to do. You know, I didn't want to obey. I mean, I was a useless pupil because really, I wasn't going to learn. Once I'd learned maths, reading and writing, I started educating myself. You know, I wasn't interested in being a pupil, so I was very destructive. And they kicked you out of school? Eventually, yeah. And I mean, that's something I really worked on for years. <laughs> Being kicked out? Oh, absolutely. Did you? I mean, if everybody was saying you're a rotten kid and you're a flop and you're no good and you're not going to make it, where did you get the confidence to feel good about yourself? I just thought to myself, if this is what they call being good, I don't want to be it. If, if being a man is like being aggressive and punching people and being a loud mouth, I don't want to be one. Okay. But then here's your mother who was subservient. Mm. Did you want to be a woman? No, not at all. What did you want to be? You see, I don't believe in the stereotypes. I don't believe there is any such thing as a real man, you know. To me, a man is, is somebody with male organs. You know, they don't, I mean, men weren't born to drink beer and women weren't born to lay on their backs, you know. I mean, that is my opinion. And I stick firmly behind that opinion. Did you have girlfriends? Did you feel you had to go through that? I had girlfriends for years. I mean, all different kinds, you know. I mean, a lot of girlfriends. Because at school, again, you know, because I was so different, I was pulled a lot of girls, you know. Did you have boyfriends too, or did the guys shun no, you? No, no, I never had boyfriends. Just not as a kid. Yeah. At 14, when you live in Woolwich, you do not have boyfriends. <laughs> I mean, the thought does not come into your head, you know. Then how, at 14, did you go out, and what, did you buy makeup or use your mother's? How did uh, you know? What happened to me was that when I left home, I left home when I was about 15. I went to live in Birmingham with some friends of mine there. And that's really where I started to, to wear a lot of makeup. And when you came home, and you saw this father 
who had an image of being a macho man, mm -hmm. and this mother who was always a little frightened. Don't tell me they just said, oh, hi, George, that's nice. I mean, they must have really had a fit. They did at first. You know, they used to freak out. My mother was always like saying, oh, what would the neighbors think? I don't blame her. Well, I resented her for saying that. Yeah. Who cares what the neighbors yeah. think? I mean, really, who cares? Yeah. What were you wearing then? What was um, the punk look? Plastic bags, mm -hmm. studs, um, toothbrushes hanging out of my ear. I mean, my father actually, to be quite honest with you, would just look above his paper and say, no kidding. Say he really could not be bothered. I mean, my mother was the one that used to edge him on. It was like, tell him, tell him to stop doing it. And my father would say, oh, for God's sake, you know, he's not killing anyone. Okay, so here you are, this punk kid, with a lot of other punk-looking mm. kids. Um, at that time, you started to go to the gay bars. Mm. Was that because it was just freer and easier, or was that... It was because what? there wasn't anywhere you could go without getting punched in the face. You know, I mean, there was a club called Louise's, which was in the West End, which was the place to go. I remember the first time I went there, somebody blew a kiss at me. And I remember I went with a few, few friends from where I lived. I was saying, that guy blew a kiss at me. I was so freaked out and absolutely so shocked. And then, like, after a while, you just think, you know, it was like you realized it didn't matter, you know. It's only that you were, you were brought up to believe that, you know, anybody who was sort of homosexual was like, you know, a disgusting pervert. You have been asked in every interview about your sexual preference. Mm. Are you bisexual? Yeah, of course okay. I am. Could you go as easily one way as the other? I mean, if, if a divine man walked in and a divine woman walked in, you wouldn't care which? <laughs> yeah, um, I think Elizabeth Taylor, when she was thin and, like, and young... And you could Montgomery be as happy Cliff. with Elizabeth Taylor as you could with Montgomery <laughs> Cliff. <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> the middle Hi, of America's then. having a heart attack. <laughs> what is it you want to say? What is it you wanted to say all your life? What's the statement? I don't think there is anything that I want to say full stop. Yeah. There's a lot of things I want to say at different times, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think that basically my attitude towards homosexuality, heterosexuality, is any love is good love. Mm. You wouldn't have, like, all the diseases you had if people were a lot more monogamous. I mean, I definitely believe in monogamy. I think that you can have a very healthy relationship, a good relationship with one person. And I think that it is better for you. Sounds old-fashioned. I don't really care if it does, you know, but I think that it is better for you. And you get more out of it. You know what Jerry Falwell said about you. I have the yeah. exact quote, but the gist of it is that a man who doesn't want to be like a man and a woman who doesn't want to be like a woman is against what God created. Well, you know, I have my own set of religious values, which I live by. And that is it. I mean, other people's religions don't, don't affect me. I believe there is one God, and that God is there for people whether they're homosexual or heterosexual, black, white, or yellow. God doesn't discriminate, and that's something that people don't realize. God does not discriminate. What do you like most about yourself? I think the fact that I'm not sort of prejudiced. Mm. I'm not prejudiced in any way. What makes you cry? The thing that makes me saddest is, is yeah. that I cannot change life for all those other Georges, people like Philip and Paul, you know, who aren't famous. I was in Hampstead the other day walking around, and I went for tea, and there were a bunch of girls laughing at Philip. You know, now if they'd known who I was, it would have been a different story. It would have been, can I have your autograph? And I hate that. You seem so wise, George, so sure of yourself for 23 years. What are the lessons you've learned? That you can have anything. You know, like when I was a kid, I used to dream, oh, what's it going to be like to be famous? I used to feel, like when I first became famous, I thought it was really like, wow, wonderful. And then you suddenly realize, you know, you just have a job. It's no different than not being famous, really. Except, you know, instead of a cage, you get a platform, you know, and people listen to you. I'm about to be sure.